Uh, but for, for all details, for those of you who want to look into, you know, methodology or anything else, there's a, there's a link down here that will, that might uh, satisfy some curiosity. Yeah, so just if you'll, if you'll permit one minute of shameless uh, self-promotion, just to okay. echo what uh, Christy kindly mentioned, which is this book called Gangsters and Other Statesmen that I've been working on for uh, a long time. And uh, uh, it's, it's a, behind the frivolous title, there is a serious argument. And although it's not exclusively about refugees in the book itself, I do encourage people to take a look at it as well if they're interested in forced migration problems, because as I'll suggest a little bit today, a lot of the global challenges regarding forced migration are very much related to mafias. And the challenges of organized crime are often one and the same as the challenges of refugee rights, asylum rights, human rights, and the dysfunctionality of the current asylum regime in the world. Many of you know that uh, there was one estimate, for example, in 2015, that estimated that refugee smuggling was just the refugee smuggling on the European side of things, the Mediterranean, right? I'll show you a map in a moment, was big business. The estimate was that $5 billion were made in 2015 alone, transporting people to their uh, uh, asylum rights that they have under international law via this criminal mechanism that's in the hands of mafia. So pre-existing organized criminal networks are the great untold story of refugee waves in the 21st century, massive forced migrations, whether it's the Rohingya in uh, Southeast Asia, whether it is, as we know, the so-called migrant caravan, scandalously so-called migrant caravan of Central American, uh, Honduran, Guatemalan, et cetera. Migrants, many of them asylum seeker refugees moving through Mexico into the United States, or whether it's Syrians that I'm gonna talk about today moving into Europe, all of those don't happen by themselves. There is a pre-existing organized criminal infrastructure that has to be in place that is a major catalyst and enabler of those things to happen. And we need to think about it very carefully. So just a kind of overview before I jump into some, some particular findings for those of you mostly who, uh, well, mostly for the undergrads who may not have uh, uh, seen some of this stuff before. So this is the uh, big picture of uh, uh, refugee distribution uh, across the world. So UNHCR data, which is kind of the, the, the gold mark, gold standard of uh, uh, estimating forced migration in the world, has us at 70 million displaced people currently, uh, give or take a little over 70 million. Um, out of those 70 million, 20, between 20 and 25 million are refugees, meaning forced migrants who crossed an international border, and the rest are what are called internally displaced persons, meaning basically refugees that have not crossed an international border or forced migrants that remain within the, the society that they are, uh, uh, that they are uh, displaced in. And there are also stateless persons and other categories that are kind of gray area hybrids. The thing to keep in mind is, of course, that Syrians are the biggest, uh, the Syrians that I will speak about, that my research was about, are the biggest single ethno-national category, whether or not you uh, think about the Kurdish uh, uh, identity category separately, which we can go into, but we don't have to, because these 6.6 .6 million Syrian refugees, in addition to the six point, roughly the same 6.7, 6.8, close to 7 million internally displaced Syrian refugees inside of what's left of Syria. And they account for the largest number of any ethno-national category, largest number of forcibly displaced people in the world. And you got about 5.5 million Syrians living in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. And Turkey is, of course, uh, uh, these figures here are not just Syrians. These are all forced migrants, but we want to keep, uh, uh, keep in mind uh, how how, how dramatic a, a share of this overall number the Syrian, the Syrian civil war has contributed to in particular. Uh, Turkey, when it comes to host countries, uh, is by far, seen, you know, is, is sui generis in every regard. It's got uh, close to 4 million refugees on its territory, and nobody has done more than Turkey in terms of humanitarian aid, in terms of any metric you would want. Erdogan's authoritarianism aside, it has to be, it has to be acknowledged that um, nobody has, has come even close to uh, delivering that level of uh, uh, hospitality combined and notwithstanding the xenophobia, the discrimination, and all the <coughs> politics which we can talk about. 
Um, Lebanon is, so Turkey, per, uh, Turkey in absolute numbers is the greatest host nation. Lebanon is the greatest host nation in per capita terms, uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the population of Lebanon is refugees. Uh, every third person on the territory of Lebanon is a refugee, uh, mostly Syrian, secondarily Palestinian, and the sky didn't fall in Lebanon. It's just striking to keep a sense of proportion when the Western countries are screaming bloody murder for accepting a fraction of a fraction of 1% uh, into their territory uh, compared, to, compared to the countries in the Middle East and, and uh, Africa. So this, this graph doesn't show the IDPs that I mentioned, who are, of course, far more numerous and in many ways uh, are, are greater humanitarian emergencies than the, the refugees themselves, but this gives you a sense of the overall of the overall problem. I should note here that Germany, which you will notice here, is an anomaly, a historical anomaly, because it is the first ever OECD uh, Western wealthy kind of fancy country to ever become a top 10 refugee hosting nation in history. And I'm going to tell you the story of how that occurred. But for now, we want to recognize that uh, the burden, so-called, of refugee, uh, 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 of, first of all, having refugees on your territory, of hosting refugee populations, having refugee camp infrastructures, dealing with the, the tremendous political and economic and every other cost uh, uh, to, uh, to elites as well as to the native population, forced migration, that all of that is predominantly the, the uh, it is not the proverbial first world problem. It is decidedly not, although the Western kind of Western Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, and so on are much louder and much more aggressive, so to speak, in uh, uh, talking about this burden. They are decidedly not the ones carrying this burden. It is predominantly poor so-called third world uh, uh, developing economies that cannot handle, as you can see, the pressure. And Germany is the only exception to this when it accepted in 2015, 2016, over a million Syrian refugees, and I'll show you how that happened. So I won't bore you with the methodology, but uh, uh, in, in, in brief, I was privileged to be part of a, uh, to head a, a research team of uh, uh, seven field workers, wonderful young people, uh, undergrad, who uh, from some of them from the Boston area, by, by origin, many of them from the Middle East, Arabic speakers, who, uh, uh, who embarked on a, crazy, on a crazy study in five different countries, Jordan, Turkey, Greece, Serbia, and Germany, at a, at a world historical moment when, a, when this unprecedented exodus of uh, Syrians began, began, to, began to move across the Balkan route into uh, Western Europe, primarily Germany, secondarily uh, 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 Scandinavia and, and uh, France and Britain. Uh, it was it was an extraordinary experience, and we had 101 problems that I can go into methodologically. Um, it is not a it is not the kind of pristine study that that we would uh, have liked because I think the kind of pristine study that we would have liked is impossible in these conditions. And I think a lot of the problems in refugee refugee uh, social science have to do with unrealistic expectations of what is even possible. Uh, in terms of access, in terms of validity, in terms of uh, how do you interview a, a uh, respondent when, how do you first of all reach a female respondent in refugee camps where women are invisible, for example, and once you reach her and build trust over weeks to uh, have her agree to do an interview, what is the quality of the data in that interview when the husband, for example, is sitting in the tent with her and nodding his head uh, before each answer. She glances at him, he nods, and then she answers. What really is the validity of something like that? Or the validity of a quick and dirty survey, which is the, the, the weapon of choice for much of the data that we get about refugees that bombards them with questions that are very stigmatized about illegal, illegal crossings or about smugglers or about uh, their status or about uh, uh, traumatic events in a 10-minute quick and dirty questionnaire, 
what is the quality of that data if you have not built the trust, if you have not thought about the ordering of the questions, if you have not thought about re-traumatization, and on and on. So there's 101 problems, and I would just like to advertise the advantage. The one advantage we did have is that uh, we did these 180 in-depth interviews, 30 of which are problematic for certain reasons that I can go into, but at bare minimum, 150 high-quality in-depth interviews where people talked for hours and talked in conditions of uh, uh, trust and in conditions of uh, relative, although not perfect, uh, uh, so that they could go into their experiences in a way that is not easy to capture. And it's a unique, it's a, and also it's a unique moment because it was the, the it was this, this period, this massive episode of Syrian uh, exodus that, that uh, was, rarely captured and that when it was captured, it was captured in a very superficial way. And we, all, we were at uh, uh, several dozen sites along the Balkan route, some of which I will, I will uh, show you. So this is the Balkan route, and this was the, the major conduit by bar none for the vast majority of people who entered from the Middle East, most of them Syrians, secondarily Iraqis and Afghans. We, we did just a study of Syrians. Um, but I'm happy to talk about the others if we have time in Q&A. So this is, the, this is the basic picture. They moved from Turkey into uh, uh, Greece, which is a Schengen EU country, having crossed this little thing here. Sometimes some of them swam. You could swim sometimes. It's a half hour boat ride, depending on where they were exactly in which islands. It's, it's even swimmable, but most of them obviously by, uh, uh, by boats, by smuggler boats. And this is, a, uh, uh, this is a perilous journey. It's not as perilous as the Libya to Italy route, which later claimed uh, many more deaths and drownings, but this was the, the, the main source of, uh, of uh, uh, deadly, deadly lethal outcomes in this period, 2014, 15, 16. Having arrived in Greece, uh, they exited EU and entered Macedonia, which is not an EU country and not a Schengen nation, they left the EU zone to proceed through these dinky, if I may say so myself, banana republics, many, some of which are my, my origin society, uh, biographically speaking. But these countries that have significant problems with organized crime and corruption, Macedonia entering into Serbia. Out of Serbia, they used to proceed northward into Hungary until Orban began to militarize the border very violently and aggressively, uh, after which the flow diverted Instead of going northward from Serbia into Hungary, it diverted westward into uh, Croatia, which is an EU country, but is not part of Schengen, another interesting complication, after which they proceeded into Slovenia, which is EU country and the Schengen zone, to get to uh, Germany, where most of them ended up. So we had uh, interviews in, in all, of these, all of these societies. The differences between the bridge societies and the destination societies are very important. The bridge societies instituted what I will uh, call a hot potato system, which means their purpose was in, before the EU-Turkey deal of 2016 to just get the refugees through our territory and off it as quickly as possible to dump them onto the next bridge society out of sight, out of mind. As long as they were on our territory, they were considered a problem, and you wanted to move them outside of the uh, outside of your outside of your sovereign territory. So it's worth noting that the reason. So several things are worth noting here. One is that mafias matter, as I indicated earlier. The reason that the Balkan route was uh, the and the reason for many of the outcomes and the the what looked at the time like the near collapse of the European Union as we know it, and all this uh, internal friction, Dublin I, Dublin II, the Visegrad countries antagonizing the core EU countries, the collapse of Schengen de facto when all the borders began to be closed again, and, it, and then it turned out that the EU is not uh, uh, living up to its own, uh, living up to its own uh, border politics and so on the non-arrival policies that were instituted, the creation of uh, uh, buffer zones. Uh, uh, you see this even after, after uh, the, Syrian, the Syrian crisis with the African crisis. Uh, when you look at, for example, how the EU has dealt with Libya in recent years, much of it is making a buffer zone out of Libya so that people cannot 
move out of Libya into Italy. And the way you do that is in, in, up to and including making very sinister deals with warlords in Libya and human traffickers in Libya to block people from proceeding into Europe. So one of the reasons all of this was possible is because organized crime was a kind of pre-existing condition on the Bal Balkan route. The Balkan route was important because it was this decades-long conduit for smuggling of things like heroin, four tons of heroin moving from Turkey into, for example, Kosovo on the Balkan route every single month. And out of those four, two proceed into Western Europe through the Balkan route. And what this means is that there is a pre-existing infrastructure of uh, 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 transnational gangster, gangster gangs cooperating with each other with safe houses, with bribed customs officials, with trucks and drivers and trusted informants and corrupt po police officials and corrupt people in the state security apparatus and corrupt uh, uh, border guards and corrupt customs officers. Uh, and one can't blame them when I say corrupt. I don't mean it in a, in a normative sense. When you have salaries of, for example, euros a month, how easy is it for a transnational mafia making billions to, uh, uh, to acquire the kind, of, the kind of infrastructure that they need? And so it turned out that it's very easy for uh, this organized criminal infrastructure to shift when there is the demand for migrants uh, uh, smuggling, to shift from smuggling drugs and other things to smuggling people. And this is not something that fell out of the sky. This is something decades long and we need to understand it. Okay. The second point is that the so-called Middle Eastern refugee crisis or the Syrian refugee crisis did not begin in the Middle East. Uh, what we call the Middle Eastern refugee crisis is that, that uh, small spillover, relatively small spillover of Middle Eastern migrants into Europe because when it reaches Europe, then it becomes a crisis. Up till then, it's not even considered a crisis, even though there is in fact this perpetual crisis in the Middle East which I indicated in the, in the previous slide. But anyway, the first uh, uh, critical moment came when asylum, when migrants from within Europe, notably from Kosovo, this one of the poorest territories in Europe, uh, began in the tens of thousands, possibly 200,000, we don't know, to move in early 2014 from Kosovo to the Hungarian border. And it was then that the uh, militarization of the border, the restrictionism, the questions about the, the uh, uh, interpretations of Dublin One, the interpretations of uh, 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 asylum politics and all the rest of it began. So it was European Kosovar Albanians from within Europe who first uh, activated these smuggler networks, who first, active, who first uh, provoked, so to speak, the restrictionist policies, and then the Middle Eastern migrants in the months to follow uh, uh, were following in the footsteps in many ways of these Albanian Kosovar migrants. And this is also an important story that has been uh, uh, forgotten. So there are other issues of geography and, and uh, internal EU politics that I won't go into now, but you want to keep in mind this, this uh, situation. I think the best way to, to show really uh, the, rather than give you some sociological, you know, um, story, I think it's best to let people talk in their own voice. So I wonder if we can spend a few minutes just reading three of our uh, subjects here, three of our respondents describing their, their, some of what they've been through. So as you can see, perhaps it's, it's uh, many, many striking things here, obviously. One is obviously that uh, 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 forced migration is, is not a kind of discrete event and is very much a process in, in, several, in several ways. One way is that the, the civil war, that's kind of the main force factor, the push factor, if you want to call it, uh, is evolving. And you may know that the Syrian civil war has gone through numerous phases 
And as these battles and massacres uh, go, you can trace different waves of Syrian refugees uh, deciding to move uh, or moving, right? There's the Battle of Idlib in 2015, and then there's another Battle of Idlib in 2020. There's the Battle of Kobani, the Battle of Bosra, the battles that some of you might have heard of, and then another siege of Homs for three years. The siege of Homs is going on, and many people don't leave right away. Some of them leave and then fail to leave, come back. Some of them come back and then uh, uh, repatriate. Some of them uh, uh, leave after the siege is over because that's the only opportunity they had because the revanchism is going to come. So there is no easy, quick and dirty answer to what the precipitating event or the immediate cause of it was, but rather uh, uh, the decision-making process is very difficult and the, the uh, uh, the narrative that we have in the interviews regarding the exact moment of sort of the decision to leave or uh, uh, is not a single decision and is often uh, a process. Uh, the third one is a good illustration of this. You have a 65-year-old male, this third, this third answer, um, who's talking about, who's talking about his, his uh, brother and people around his wife, uh, his family getting killed. Is a 65-year-old male, he's a bus driver, political preferences. He didn't care about Assad. He didn't care about the uh, Arab Spring. He didn't care about the Alawite Sunni's uh, story, right? Got his house and car bombed in an airstrike, lost, lost uh, his, all his belongings for, for that matter, but doesn't leave then, leaves months later when the pressure on his other, when people start dying, right? So uh, there's a variety of motivations. A lot of those motivations are uh, um, complex. Uh, a lot of the decision-making process revolves around other people and not the, the subject themselves, right? So there's all, this, there's all this complexity. And the move is, as you see in this first quote, uh, is not linear. So sometimes it's circular. They go and come back. Sometimes it involves a lot of waiting and kind of incremental movement first within their hometown, including Homs, which is reduced to rubble, but nevertheless, you stay within Homs, not in your exact residence, but in Homs for months on end before proceeding out of Homs. You still stay in Syria for months and months on end, and then try when it's possible to move to Turkey. So it's this, uh, uh, it's very, it's, it goes in phases and it interacts obviously with the, the pressures of the civil war as they, as they evolve. This is some of our uh, uh, smiling subjects. Uh, uh, in, in a camp in Jordan. This is another fascinating quote, at least to me. I, I wonder if we can just, let me give you a minute to read this now. So as you might see, uh, one, of the, one of the cliches really in, in the forced migration literature that you might have come across, some of you, is you know, we have this intuitive idea of a refugee as somebody who doesn't have choice, doesn't have agency, doesn't have the decision to leave as sort of not their own, uh, but is forced. The thought is that's what refugees are all about, almost by definition. But what makes them different from unforced migrants, for example, is that that initial decision, they had no choice but to leave. They had to leave. It was an involuntary decision, involuntary migration. And of course, that's very misleading because as we see here, the initial act of leaving is very much a choice. And that refugee agency needs to be understood uh, in this complex kind of uh, 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 op option menu where the choice is made over a period of time. It's made sometimes collectively. There is oscillation. Opportunities arise, and then uh, uh, misperceptions of those opportunities sometimes lead to very risky decisions and so on. But there's no doubt that the act of staying is often safer, and that the act of not moving is often, even though it's dreadful conditions and so on, uh, are often described in the interviews as more familiar, more uh, secure, more honorable, 
then the act of leaving, which is considered more dangerous, which is considered a leap into the unknown, which is often full of regret and anxiety and remorse and a kind of survivor's guilt of the sort that you can read about in you know, Holocaust narratives or whatever of why did I get to leave and I paradoxically feel even worse now that I've left and I don't have the artillery shelling. I paradoxically feel even worse here where I'm not being shelled because I'm so far away and why did I get to leave and leave my spouse behind or, or God forbid my children behind, right? So there is this uh, interesting uh, theme that emerges from the interviews that there is a greater uncertainty, greater danger, greater catastrophe in the choice of leaving and that this choice of leaving in this striking example in particular can be deadly. So this woman who has a sniper behind her building and the single most uh, deadly, uh, the single most near death experience that she had was not on the boat ride to Europe, was not anywhere else and was not sitting at home for months on end, years as the civil war was going on, but was the decision to have herself marked by going out, stepping out and visibly engaging in the act of leaving her city by getting into a taxi cab and she could get killed like a bird or what's the metaphor she uses right there in front of her building. And there's no doubt that it would have been safer like the, the others remaining to stay inside her building, but chose because of her elderly mother who had a problem with cancer uh, to, leave, uh, uh, to leave the building. So this is just to show how complicated some of these dilemmas are and uh, to, to, to complicate some of our understanding of refugee agency, which we can talk more about. Now, one of the things we began to see that really surprised us was that a lot of the riskiest, most traumatic, most uh, 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 most most uh, endangering events uh, from the moment of leaving Syria to the moment of wherever we are doing the interview, right? The further we the further we we speak to them, obviously, by the time they reach Germany, they will have accumulated on average more risk events than uh, people who we are speaking to in Greece, who only just arrived uh, in Europe and and uh, have fewer legs of the journey on their way, right? But one of the most striking themes was that a lot of the, the dangerous situations and near-death experiences in particular were a result of smugglers adapting themselves to anti-smuggler repression or to fear of arrest or to you know, uh, smugglers engaging in evasions of various sorts, putting the refugees in danger, right? What we call shifted risk, they shift the risk to themselves, the criminals do, to, uh, from themselves to the refugees. And here you have a very striking illustration of this where uh, uh, the smuggler uh, uh, abandons the ship that he is, a uh, ship of 65 people in this case, uh, on the Mediterranean, abandons the ship midway. And this elderly Syrian male who is, who is describing this is a diabetic, couldn't get insulin, or treatment throughout his journey and the treatment that he did get, he describes as uh, outdated for sugar in his blood in Greece elsewhere. Uh, and what's interesting about him is that he had this experience, the smuggler leaves in the middle of the journey, leaves the boat without any pilot, without any driver, anybody knowing how to operate the boat, gets on a little smaller dinghy and leaves so that he doesn't have to deal with capture. This respondent, this subject, takes over the boat for the obvious reason of you're floating in the open sea and you may all drown. So he takes the decision to pilot the boat. Um, and he pilots the boat safely to Greece and saves these people's lives and saves his own life uh, uh, in the process. When he arrives in Greece, he is arrested and imprisoned for being a smuggler, for himself being a smuggler. Uh, as he says, you are the smugglers you were driving. You know, impeccable, impeccable reasons. So because he was arrested, this led to the forceful separation of him from his wife and children who proceeded to Germany. And then when we were speaking to, speaking to him, they are already in Germany and he is released after three and a half months of Greek prison because, uh, because he is exonerated, right? But it's an illustration of how a lot of what was happening was uh, uh, refugees taking the, taking the, uh, the, the hit for, for uh, uh, smugglers who are being targeted by European restrictionist policies. And so we pursued this further and found that 
somewhat counterintuitively. Uh, so basically, uh, I'll just go over this very quickly. We cataloged across our uh, uh, interviews uh, every single you know horror story that happened to them uh, uh, on routes. So every time they had injury, every time they had a near death experience, a near drowning, every time they were arrested or nearly arrested, or every time they were forcibly separated from their traveling companions or from their children, any time they were uh, uh, stolen from, tra you know, smugglers steals from them, policemen rob them, uh, uh, a policemen beat them up, attack dogs of the policemen bite them, you know, uh, basically everything except illness, uh, which we excluded, and rather conservatively, we excluded some other some other uh, 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 kind of things that happened on route. But, but it's a fairly exhaustive catalog of all the all the uh, bad things that happened to them on route. And then, if you ask the question, well, who was doing the 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 the, the horror story to them, right? And uh, the traditional way we thought about it was, you know, some of this is government induced, and some of them is. Uh, smuggler induced that is to say policemen beat them up or police Hungarian Hungarian uh, customs officers steal their belongings Hungarian customs officers steal their money or Greek uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, policemen uh, drop them off at a golden dawn uh, uh, right-wing right-wing militia for them to get beaten up right it's a Greek police officer so any re government representatives police and army the primary category being Turkish military. In our sample, Turkish military representatives accounted for uh, a tremendous amount of uh, harm, right? To be contrasted from when the smuggler is doing things to them, right? So the smuggler steals their passport. The smuggler lies to them about uh, uh, when they will do. The smuggler locks them against their uh, uh, wishes in a room, forceful, forceful deportation or forceful movement or forceful separation from children takes the children away and says at gunpoint and says until you give me more money, neither of you are going anywhere, that kind of thing. And of course, this is where the boundary for, between smuggling and trafficking uh, gets crossed. Uh, and the distinction between smuggler and trafficker is something we can, we can perhaps go into in the, in the Q&A. But then what really surprised us was that the bulk of the risk events were neither government induced nor smuggler induced, but the sort of thing that I just showed you earlier, which is risk being shifted to the migrant, to the refugee, because the state is cracking down on smugglers, because the state is raiding uh, 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 human smugglers, raiding the criminals, trying to crack down on the criminals, doesn't end up hurting the criminals, ends up hurting the refugees themselves. And this is a very important, we feel, policy uh, uh, issue and is a kind of classic example of the unintended consequence of anti-smuggler repression, most of which does not hurt the organized criminals or the smugglers or the traffickers, but ends up hurting the refugees themselves. And this is something to be taken very, uh, very seriously. The single greatest uh, uh, example of this, the single most common example of this, is the fact that as Europe militarized the Mediterranean more and more and more, the drownings escalated. Drownings of migrants, dead, you know, uh, one of you mentioned uh, before we began the striking image of the, the little child corpse washing up on a Turkish beach resort, and this is very bad imagery, and everybody starts reacting when we see this, right? So if you look at the aggregate uh, uh, drowning uh, data and the trends, the pattern of drownings, it is perfectly correlated with the level of restrictionism, the level of militarizing the Mediterranean, as the state cracks down on smuggling, the more the state cracks down on smuggling, the more the drownings escalated. And the reason was precisely these shifted risk events that we are trying to draw attention to, namely when the boat ride was relatively, uh, uh, when the smugglers felt that the state is not going to, is probably not going to uh, uh, arrest them, they transported their clients by themselves. They were piloting the boats themselves, right, from Greece to Turkey, and then returning the empty boats. The smuggler, kind of low-level smuggler, low-level criminal, a lot of them are themselves refugees because the smugglers recruit refugees when they don't have enough money or they're stuck somewhere, for example, to uh, recruit others for smuggling journeys and so on, right? But these low-level smugglers would pilot the boats and then bring them back empty. 
As the militarization crackdown anti-smuggler campaign begins, the critical shift happens, number one, that there's no pilot anymore. Because why should the smuggler risk it? Why should he go there? Why should he pilot? And instead, they take the group of 60, stu 60 students, 60 refugees, and say, you know, oh, you, yes, you, you look like a strapping young lad. Here's the engine. Here's the motor. You see that point over there? That's Greece. Off you go. And so that's one obvious reason why the drownings increase, because you have no pilots piloting the boat. You have the refugees themselves piloting the boat. And the second major reason is now that they decided not to risk it, the smuggler is not going over there and taking an empty boat back. Why should he waste the, that boat is not coming back anymore because there's no pilot. And so why should he risk the investment? Why should he waste money on a quality fancy boat? And so what they do is shift to dinghies, very low quality, unsafe blow up dinghies instead of the boats that they used to come back because it's a, it's a loss of profit. And so you buy the, the, the crappiest, so to speak, boat that you can and uh, uh, pack it with refugees, which also contributed to the spike in drowns. So let me get rid of these now. So let me show you a testimony in that regard. I've been a little slow, so let me just quickly summarize it for you, and maybe many of you can look at this on your own, uh, on your own time. But basically, this woman was a, a victim of such a shift of risk events. The, the smuggler told her that they would be piloted. Uh, he, he told her and her husband, this is in the original English, by the way, this is not translated from as an English tutor, Syrian English tutor. And she and her husband are speaking to us about, to me, about six out, you know, maybe, maybe 15 hours after this near death experience. So after she nearly drowned, she's telling us this. And what's remarkable is they, the smuggler told her you would get what she paid for was to get piloted into Greece. She doesn't get piloted because they just put them on a boat and say, go by yourself. They get, of course, the motor goes off, something goes wrong, and they start floating. This is uh, November, December, Mediterranean open sea, and the temperature is a serious proposition in the winter in the Mediterranean. The cold is a serious proposition. And so they're all flood. People are falling into the, into the water. Children are screaming. It's a very desperate situation. She picks up the phone and calls the Greek police coast guard. And the Greeks say, you are illegal immigrants. We can't, this is all illegal. We can't, they're gonna, you know, forget it. Call Turkey, where you came from. She calls the Turkish coast guard. This is this 112108 that she's calling on her cell phone. The Turkish coast guard says, you are illegal immigrants. This is trafficker. We don't have anything to do with it. Call the Greeks. Then she calls the smuggler who put her into the dastardly situation on his uh, cell phone. And he says, as you can see, my job was to put you on the boat. This is my job. Here, my mission is finished. If you drown, this is up to Allah. And so the thing to understand is that, of course, uh, the, the government restrictionism is very much, uh, uh, they all survived in this case. But many of them in this situation didn't survive. And uh, the blood of these situations is very much on the hands, not just of these smugglers, but of the governments who are not thinking through this kind of policy. And what's also remarkable, coming to my next point, is the extent to which this woman has no bitterness towards the smuggler whatsoever. She says, he is like us. I don't blame him. He is our friend. He saved us. He is not responsible. It's not his responsibility. And this is part of a broader trend where there is a serious trust problem going on vis-a-vis -vis smugglers compared to the trust vis-a-vis -vis government representatives, NGO representatives, INGO representatives. We, as observers on the side, tend to assume that the smugglers are the root of all evil and that they are criminals and traffickers and exploitators of you know, human suffering. And sometimes we're even tempted to think, my goodness, if only we get rid of the smugglers, the refugee problem is going to be solved forever. Of course, the refugees themselves see the smugglers in a very, very different light. They see them as allies, they see them as guides, they see them as friends, as people who are getting them out of hell, right? In contrast, the people that we as observers who kind of parachute into refugee camps think of as on the side of the angels, the NGO workers, the humanitarian aid workers, the, the local refugee commissariat, the Danish Refugee Council, the doctor, the well-meaning doctor who's giving them advice, the government, the Ministry for Labor that's giving them advice, the pamphlets that are coming from the right, that whole infrastructure is considered 
very dangerous, is considered alienating, and there's a very strong theme of just distrust, mistrust, be careful, never reveal yourself, conceal, manipulate your identity, manipulate your representation, do anything you can to minimize, as it were, the interaction with those people, all the while the trust of the smugglers is very high. And this is very striking up to and including doctors and medical care. So we saw things like, you know, did you see the doctors here in the camp? Many of these camps have excellent clinics, multiple clinics. So sometimes you have a clinic for uh, a private clinic from, from uh, excuse me, a, a government clinic from the locality. In NGO clinic of, for example, Israeli doctors who came and speak Arabic perfectly, who came through an NGO to open up a second clinic and they're seeing 75 patients a day. Are they taking advantage? You go to see the doctor said, no, thank you. They will say, I am sick. They will say, you are sick, goodbye. I am healthy, I am educated. I will be no problem in Europe. Notice that the very, the very uh, uh, question of engaging with medical care is perceived through the lens of these people want to test me. They don't really want to give me medical care. What they really want is to figure out, am I a good refugee or a bad refugee, or am I even perhaps a terrorist? The second one, my daughter has a cold. They were good, she got medicine, but we don't trust doctors. The doctors ask you, how did you get this injury? Are you for the revolution or are you for Assad? And then you are finished, you will never leave. So tremendous skepticism, tremendous uh, distrust, tremendous avoidance, which is a problem. And then on the other side, this, is from our survey data. This is the, the Yelp of smugglers. The Yelp of the, so this is like Yelp for restaurants, but we asked them, how satisfied were you with your, smug many of them had multiple smugglers, right? Um, and yeah, that, so this is, this is quite striking. This is uh, uh, the, the disjuncture between uh, 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 the, the nature of human smuggling and how the clients, so to speak, of human smuggling are uh, uh, developing relationships with these people. There is, of course, a lot of trafficking as a subset of the, the, all the smuggling experiences. But on the whole, our experiences in the interview especially is that the horror stories that they tell about mistreatment at the hand of smugglers pale in comparison to the horror stories that they tell about mistreatment at the hands of police, at the hands of soldiers, at the hands of border officers, and at the hands of NGO representatives and INGO representatives and all those people working on the side of the angels who are lying to them or obscuring what their rights are or not giving them what they promised or denying them something that's very important to them or forcing them to go through some procedures that don't make any sense or failing to communicate information that is important to them on and on and on. Uh, this is this is very important to think about and more broadly a lot of the migration process is informed not by the posters at refugee camps not by the suggestions that people get by caseworkers or by NGOs or by the local governments that that when you walk in you know to a refugee camp the Syrians were bombarded and refugees around the world still are bombarded with information that they don't need and a lot of times that they don't understand. A big poster that publishes, you know, this is the asylum law section 16 of so-and-so of, of the Republic of Greece or the Republic of Macedonia in Farsi and then in Arabic and here's another one in English. And of course, most of them don't care about any of that. And even when they do care, it's nothing very, uh, uh, very salient to the day-to-day -day decisions of where am I going to go, where am I going to sleep, how am I going to get food, how am I going to get some, some resource that is going to do the resilience for me, right? The, the information that they do care about, especially in the bridge countries, uh, is things like how am I going to get out of here? How am I going to cross the border illegally? Which smuggler is reliable, which smuggler is a trafficker, and which smuggler can I trust, and who can I ask about the people who left before me, how can I follow in their footsteps, and what border should I cross, should I go into Hungary, or should I go into Croatia, proceeding from this bridge country. A whole slew of questions that are taboo, that are uh, 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 
perceived by people working in the camps, NGO people, especially government people, law enforcement, as taboo because they seem to be inviting people to commit some crime or to violate some, some rule. But those are the ones that actual refugees on the ground are worried about and thinking about, about their, their, their life and safety and family reunification. But they are bombarded by information that is completely irrelevant to them. And the information that is relevant to them is taboo and nobody wants to talk to them about it. And so the criminals do talk to them about it. And so the smugglers, of course, become tremendous sources of information, informants, not just smugglers, but I single out smugglers because they are the single, single most important category. But in general, the movement is it, the decisions that they have to make on a day-to-day -day basis are overwhelmingly informed by gossip and truths and sometimes half-truths and information from unofficial mid-level agents, not governments and NGOs and INGOs who are not just mistrusted, but, but are failing to communicate to them about things that are important, to them, right? And notice what this means, of course, that for their own cynical self-interest, smugglers sometimes, for example, one case, why did you go to the Croatia border? Oh, sorry, why did you go to the Hungarian border when obviously the Hungarian border crossing is the most dangerous decision you could have possibly made because the Hungarians are crazy and because Orban, as many of you may know, but you know the single, the single most uh, aggressive restrictionist policy with the attack dogs and the very aggressive uh, border guards is on the Serbia-Hungaria border. And he decides to go through the Serbia-Hungaria border. He gets attacked, beaten, robbed of everything he has. And it's bad enough that he gave all this money to the smuggler for the, for the uh, pleasure of that experience. But then the policemen at the Hungarian border beat him up and say, this is, this is Majerosh Hungary. Remember the name so that, you can never, so that you will never come back here. And then he gets dumped back into Vojvodina across the border when the smuggler who recommended to him that he should go that way reaches him you know, in his warm embrace and says, oh, it didn't work out? I'm so sorry it didn't work out. I had no idea it wouldn't work out. Who knew? But don't worry if you get another couple of hundred euros in the next couple of weeks, we, perhaps we can try again, right? So there's this incentive for smugglers. They don't all do it. And many of them are honest people who are trying to help these people get to where they belong and to secure their asylum rights, which are otherwise denied to them to such an extent that only criminal mechanisms remain. But that's a bigger story. Um, but, you know, a lot of them for their interest are exploiting migrants abusing this trust that they have, almost a monopoly on trust that they have among these desperate people who are dumped in Europe in an alien culture, alien civilization. You know, they know about as much about the Balkans as you and I as Americans would know if we were dumped in, into Homs, for example, and, or Halep, and say, you know, do you know your way around? No, you don't know anything about the way around. So it's very easy to exploit this trust for their own purposes to make that give them false information or misleading information, which leads to them doing lethal uh, decisions, lethal near death risks and terrible risk taking instead of Croatian border, which is, of course, much safer. Both are illegal, but one is obviously from a uh, uh, not just from a human rights perspective, but a humanitarian perspective, but from the perspective of governments interested in not footing the bill of hospitalization costs and, and various other expenses associated with refugees suffering, right? So from a variety of perspectives, it would make a lot more sense for governments to take the lead in uh, communicating some of these topics to refugees. So I'm doing badly on time. My understanding is we have about until 2.30. Is that correct? So I might be a little can anyone even hear me? I realize I may be just talking into the ether. I can't see it. Yeah, it'd, okay. it'd be 1.30 our time, but control, but. I see, yes, uh, okay. Some students me, might me, pop off, but. Let me, let me end with uh, a, a small overview of the variety of refugee camps, because I think it's important about where this stuff is happening and where a lot of the uh, uh, critical, critical uh, uh, events and uh, uh, critical junctures really uh, on these trajectories on the, the forced migration happen. And they happen at these camps. And the camps are uh, very, according to these two dimensions I uh, planted here, 
One is the, uh, the horizontal one, which is regulation, which refers basically to how regulated are these places? How much of a government NGO, INGO presence is there? Is there a UNHCR booth, which is distribute, which is counting who's coming in and out? Is there a fence which designates where the camp ends and where the camp begins? Is there the Danish Refugee Council, as well as the local Ministry of Labor, as well as the volunteers from, uh, from uh, uh, IOM, as well as the, right? Or is it very unregulated, uh, 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 no boundaries, no toilets, no mobile toilets that somebody installs, for example, and bottom up in the sense that the refugees themselves have congregated there and created a camp-like situation in formal settlement without any formal government uh, or NGO, INGO presence, right? That's regulation, and they vary. On the vertical side is permanence, which we should think of like, you know, is this camp something like Zatari camp in uh, Jordan, which, which many of us visited, right? The kind of most popular one to visit, which is there for years and which is going to continue to be there, second biggest camp in the world, right? And it's, it's it may become the longest standing refugee camp uh, uh, in history, who knows, right? But certainly for months on end, years on end, permanent camps which have a kind of rootedness to them and a kind of institutionalization, and they're there to stay. In contrast to impermanent camp, transitory camps, temporary camps that are the ones that we don't necessarily study as well as the permanent ones, whose function is to perpetuate that hot potato system that I mentioned. They may be regulated or not, but they are there for a couple of weeks or they are there for a month or even a couple of months and then disappear because they, uh, the refugees themselves leave or because they were never designed to have any kind of permanence because we don't want these people on our territory. And this is a temporary measure, a holding action camp, not permanent camp, right? And so I sketched some of the, I listed some examples, but it's important to think about how depending on the kind of camping at different challenges and different phenomena are going to have very, very different effects and consequences and considerations and perceptions from the people they live. For example, smugglers. So in a regula if you're a regulated camp and you are something like Azraq in Jordan, where only the problem cases go and where uh, terror right across the border, right? and where terrorists and possible, possible uh, uh, troublemakers are disproportionately sent and where my team and I were kicked out unceremoniously, even though we had access from somebody directly in the Jordanian monarch royal family, even then you get kicked out how obsessed they are with security, highly regulated camp, and many people whisper how it's more like a prison than it is a refugee camp, right? So if it's a regulated camp like that, Smugglers are a pain in the neck. They are a big danger. They are taken extremely seriously. They are, for all we know, tortured, though we don't have any evidence of this, but uh, nobody would be surprised if that's the case. Unambiguously kind of irredeemable evil, the smugglers in Azraq camp, even though they are often effective, including in smuggling people out of Azraq camp in Jordan into Zatari camp in Jordan, which is considered a paradise hotel compared to the Azraq camp, which is a lot more repressive. So you even have smugglers moving. There's an infrastructure of smugglers moving refugees from one refugee camp to another, let alone from the refugee camps into urban neighborhoods or from uh, uh, one country. So smuggler, smuggling, is, smuggling services are also right, right? In contrast, if you are an unregulated camp, if you are, for example, Pireus Port in Greece, unregulated, no, no fence, no police, no entry, exit, nobody keeps data. There's a couple of booths that people put mostly ceremoniously, some NGOs, local NGO, humanitarian do-gooders. But no, no, it's not on the map, for example, of the Ministry of Labor. If you talk to the Greek government, it officially doesn't exist, this camp, with hundreds of tents that's been there for a while, right? So in these unregulated camps, the smugglers are considered not the worst thing in the world. And you interview the policemen in Greece, what about, are you aware that you can just walk, you know, smugglers walking around freely? I can interview them, you can interview them. The policeman says, you know, leave it alone. It's not the worst thing in the world because it's a natural mechanism for these refugees to leave. They don't want to be here. We don't want them to be here. This camp is just an anomalous kind of temporary situation in Pireus Port. It's not an official permanent camp. 
we don't really want it to be here. And so let the smugglers deal with what, let them do what they're doing because it's a natural way for the refugees to get out of here and maybe they can proceed to Macedonia so they're finally out of our hair, right? So we have other things to worry about. People are setting themselves on fire in Idomeni camp or whatever it may be, but the smugglers are not considered a danger and may even informally, there's this laissez-faire, looking the other way attitude, right? So you see this a lot in a lot of these unregulated informal settlement camps, including at border zones. So for example, I showed you that Balkan map. You see this anywhere where the government has a de facto policy of allowing smugglers when the smugglers are getting people off of our territory, but being extremely restrictionist and security minded with a capital S cracking down on smugglers if the smugglers are getting people into our territory. Then you get the chest thumping, then you get the press conferences, we just arrested 16 traffickers and on and on. But if the smugglers are serving the function at a border zone moving them northward, and uh, dumping them onto the next country, there is often a laissez-faire attitude, which people will freely tell you, informants in the state apparatus, they will tell you about it. Freely. So depending on the camp, smugglers can be a disaster catastrophe or a cure, and that's why it's important. Or just one final example. Consider this Idomeni camp that I mentioned in Greece. It got a lot of press coverage, including for some rioting and so on. Um, in Greece, there was a woman who started a bakery in the Domeni camp, and this bakery picked up a lot of steam and became very successful. She's making bread, indigenous uh, 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 Syria, sorry, not in it, but uh, a Syrian refugee, making bread, a little informal bakery. The bread is delicious, and she's selling to indigenous people outside of the camp in Thessaloniki or wherever it is, as well as to other Syrians. She becomes a kind of mini institution. Everybody knows her in the camp. They come to her on a daily basis for self-sustenance. She begins to have a little mini business. It's a sprawling kind of bakery that this woman has. From the perspective of Idomeni camp, this was considered a disaster because this was considered a temporary camp and because this was considered, although it was regulated, it was a transitory temporary camp situation we are not in the business of keeping these people here. We are not in the business of assimilating these Syrians into the locality. This camp is here as a temporary holding action, a bridge, a, a, uh, so that they can move forward, so that they can move on. And so anything that is anchoring, like this woman's bakery, anything that is, even smells or you know, begins to appear like it might be a reason for people to stay or to uh, be integrated into the locality is considered a, right? In contrast, in permanent camps, that kind of activity is not only welcomed, but wholeheartedly embraced. You have Champs-Élysées in Zatari camp, a sprawling uh, 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 informal economy of such women, small businesses selling transistors, selling tires, fixing small electronics, fixing cell phones, selling, wheeling, dealing. You allow all kinds of activity, economic activity, and even give it licenses if you are a permanent camp, because the function of a permanent camp is to uh, uh, help the refugees help themselves. And so all this anchoring, the more the better, because every service that they provide, you don't have to provide as the camp management. So again, the same phenomenon has very, very different uh, perspectives and outcomes. This is an example of the permanent, highly regulated camps, Zatari, Azraq. They are engaged in permanent crisis management. This is not a city. This is not a urban kind of citizenship thing, like some people in the literature talk about it. There is nothing more misleading than to call it a city because there is no freedom of movement. There is no real civic rights of any sort, and it's very misleading. And furthermore, they have very good PR. So when you're doing field work, I hope some of you undergraduates may be inspired to go do field work in these things. You want to be very careful of the public relations developed uh, Twitter account that Zatari has to put messages like love is in the air at Zatari and the like. Uh, this conceals a lot. And you want to look at suicide rates. You want to look at domestic abuse. You want to look at how good these camps are at showing you as an outsider, you come into the camp they are very, very good at showing you what you are allowed to be shown and not necessarily the dirt behind the ear or the things that are not functioning so well, but that are there. So uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that has a lot of uh, uh, refugee misery tourism, 
and people feel like they live in a zoo in part because people like us come from the outside to kind of parachute in for uh, uh, an afternoon where we have a very carefully regulated set of things to see and then when we leave we have very misleading impression right and life goes on transitory highly regulated camps are the ones that are the hot potato system here the slogan is keep it moving here the rotation rate of refugees is cl as close to 100 percent as you can get it sometimes 50 75 percent which means every day you have 75 percent of the residents are new people and the the whole logic is get them off of our territory as quickly as possible. How long do they stay here? Only as long as they can get back on their feet to continue moving. What food or medical services should we provide here? Is it permanent hospitals? Is it permanent schools, for example? Like in Zatari, you have long-standing schools, one for boys, one for girls. No, you only provide the medical and educational and every other care just enough, just necessary to get them back on their feet to get rid of some injury or something so that they can continue moving, right? Uh, and then finally, this is Pireu's port that I mentioned, completely informal, completely unregulated, bottom-up settlement that only existed uh, 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 temporarily, but that was extremely important because uh, uh, smugglers converged here, because uh, uh, because of this, and, and again, there was this interesting dynamic of the state negligence combined with all these very, very important outcomes happening for the refugees at Pireus Port and not at the official, the official government camps, right? And there is this not so subtle message of, you know, get lost from the police, from the local uh, 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 government uh, representatives where they are expecting this to disappear by itself minimal regulation, you put a few booths up or toilets up maybe to keep hygiene, but nothing above and beyond that because you don't want to incentivize any permanence. You are against permanence, you are just doing transitory hot potato system. Okay, I'll stop here, but this raises some, uh, here's a list of some, some uh, kind of contradictory purposes that a lot of these camps have, and I think this applies to uh, much broader uh, uh, a much broader kind of global global scope, including at the U.S.-Mexico border that I know some of you have visited in Arizona, and it's another perfect example of how there is an overemphasis on the formal kind of, in, in the United States case, it's kind of privatized detention facilities run by private corporations, which adds another very interesting dimension to the overlapping purposes and jurisdictions and so on, uh, but there is a tremendous overemphasis on the refugee camps that are official at the expense of the camps that may be much more consequential and significant that are fleeting and that are made by migrants themselves often from the bottom up huge settlements of sometimes hundreds of people spending day in and day out in a given locality and congregating and creating housing structures and creating their own little informal economy we need to move towards understanding those as well um, so i'll stop there thank you very much for your attention and I can I can now I'm afraid I don't see anybody but I will try to now look also at the ch at the chat room and invite some questions perhaps we have about half an hour for questions and feel free if any students have questions or anybody in the audience has questions just you can also unmute yourself and speak I personally was wondering, um, from my experience being on the U.S.-Mexico border, um, some of the organizations do have different um, information that they release, official information that they share with um, migrants hoping to cross the border on where the safest place is, like where they can find like water outposts set by other nonprofits, et cetera. So I was curious whether you saw any like successful information campaigns um, in any of these. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad you bring that up. I would, I, I would love to hear more about some of the success, some of the best practices in that regard, because I think uh, in our experience in, in, in the, the Balkan route, at least, but in Europe more generally, uh, there is, there's a real failure to even consider something like that. It's such a taboo that people are terrified, both at the, at the government level, at the NGO level, that the government's not going to breathe down their neck if they even come to communicate about illegal border crossings. 
where you know uh, anything that is stigmatized, anything that is including things like sex trafficking, very stigmatized. Um, uh, you know, have you did you cross illegally or not? Anything in that realm is just a kind of taboo subject that people prefer not to talk about. Of course, the rational thing to do, and what I call a kind of targeted advice policy in, in, in a paper that I, that I could share is, of course, it makes sense for the gut because if the government doesn't talk about such practical decisions as water, hygiene, how to avoid the sex drug, how to know which border crossing is right, uh, the, gov the, the smugglers will. If the government and NGO and NGO sector does not clearly engage with those questions, criminals will. And that's a sad fact of life. And I think that uh, the, the overcaution that at least the Europeans have in communicating transparently about such issues is, is, is a real, uh, is, is, is itself criminal. It's the, kind, the, the metaphor I like to use is needle exchange programs. So as every public health uh, uh, specialist will, will explain to us, if you're interested in the heroin problem or some other, some other drug injection, narcotics problem with needles, you have to understand that if you give them free needles, free clean needles, you're going to do this decreasing of disease, decreasing of spreading and all the rest of it. And the stupid way to look at that is, oh, they're promoting drug use. Oh, they're promoting heroin smuggling by giving, when the governments give free needles. Of course, the smarter strategic public health way to look at that is the government has a perfectly sensible interest in saying, listen, we do not condone any kind of narcotics use. Furthermore, it's very criminalized and we will arrest you and we will prosecute you if you engage in heroin use. However, if you are going to do it, use these clean needles. And everybody knows that that's a sensible policy. And the government does talk out of both sides of its mouth in that regard, but the data is clear that that saves lives. Similarly, a lot of these European countries, if they were smart, would say something to the effect of crossing borders illegally is highly criminalized. If you engage with smugglers, we will arrest you. If you engage with traffickers, we will prosecute you. But if you are going to do it, here's a list of things you should know. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's politically very sensitive and it would require a kind of, uh, it's, I've, been, I've been advising people, including the European, and everybody nods their head, but then. I mean, I have been seeing quite a number of EU-sponsored research papers coming out about changing, you know, trying to understand where people are getting the information about the passage and what's waiting on the other side um, as a means to try and make sure that the information that they're getting is going to lead them to the safest choice. Because I think one of the things that I take from your, your talk that's really powerful is, one, that these are processual decision-making. Um, they sort of happen along a, a chain of events and not simply, you know, you're forced, there's an explosion and you run, right? Um, so people are seeking to get information and are they, how do they, who do they trust? Um, you know, I've, I've seen, I remember one paper, I forget the author, um, talking about, as you said, people are much more likely to trust smugglers, anyone else who is non-governmental. Um, and so are there ways that then you can communicate using those, those, um, those channels to somehow also indicate the kind of um, the reality of the situation. So. Yeah, that's beautifully put. That's, that's a great, very concise and much better way of what I was trying to say. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, are there other questions from students? I know we, we do have some students here who are part of um, our IAS research team. So I'll just ask a question. On, on behalf of our class, uh, I'm just gonna get two classes here represented. Can you tell us a little bit about how you found your way into this project? Yes, sure. So uh, partly by accident, I've been studying Kosovo for for a long time, and one of the uh, one of a very high level UNHCR uh, representative in the UNHCR Belgrade office, which covers a lot of the Balkan stuff, invited me. Hey, you want to go to this camp on the Macedonia border? And out of curiosity, just I wasn't a force. I wasn't studying refugees. I was in. I study separatist movements. It wasn't mm -hmm. my field, 
But in 2015, I by accident ended up going there. And the minute I came, I realized very quickly that this is a, a world historical his moment of the sort that you get maybe twice in a lifetime. And for me, it was, even though I come from Yugoslavia, where we had four wars and hyperinflation and all the rest of it, I was, I found myself in a moment in, uh, in this uh, situation where it was winter like this, in fact, I think in, in uh, December, this is one of those early months. And so I ended up staying 7 a.m. To, to 11 p.m. every day for about a month in this, in this transitory camp. This was the biggest Preshevo camp border. It was the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest refugee camp of the entire, of the entire period from uh, early 2014, when it started to trickle in, through the peak in 2015 summer, up until March 2016, when the EU-Turkey deal was done. It was an abandoned tobacco factory, transformed into a makeshift camp, because 2,000 people a day were coming in, every single day, 2,000 people, 2,000 people, every single day moving. And, the sto and you can imagine, uh, it's, uh, I showed you some of the story. They, they just came back from nearly drowning. They just came back, lost their child. One, a child died because of some medical, they had to bury them. You buy the, you, you, you find the local uh, uh, mosque because it's an Albanian town, ethnic Albanian Muslim town. So you find the local mosque who's gonna bury the kid. How are you gonna hire translators? Who are the translators? This lady here is a, is a 19 year old girl in the middle, Sanya, playing with the two Syrian kids. And this is her first job in, in, uh, in her life because she made the unfortunate decision of studying Arabic in Belgrade University, which is a sure way to condemn yourself to unemployment for the rest of your life. But here she is, she got this job and it's her first job ever. She works right from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. When the, when the camp gates closed and she was officially a translator. Unofficially, she was the, the PTSD clinician and she was also the babysitter, and she was also the parental guidance counselor, and she was also the bodyguard when fights broke out, and she was just tremendous adaptation and institutional yeah. confusion energy, and it was just a unique experiment to look at. And so after that, long story short, I did a month, month's ethnography there, and then I was lucky enough to join forces with, a, with an excellent uh, Team that I should mention, uh, head by Dennis Sullivan from the, the Boston Consortium for Arab Region Studies, who who had the who had the infrastructure to take this to the next level and to take it to Jordan, where he had access to all the camps, where he got us into the camp to to, to go to Turkey, to go to Greece, and to go to Germany, and uh, and then we just we just jumped into this uh, over over the next two years, um, so it was really fortuitous for me to, but it, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Any other final questions? There's a question in the chat. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't actually. So have you had any interaction with refugee children? And if so, what were your experiences and how, how were the children being supported? The question is from Maya. Thank you, Maya. Oh, so we, we excluded children from the sample itself, obviously. So we didn't, we didn't, as part of the sample survey, but yeah, children, I mean, as we know, so the, uh, a majority of refugees are children, right? And women. So when we say refugee of that whole population I mentioned, more than 50% are children and closer to 60% are women. Um, Syria, there's a great deal of literature on, on unaccompanied minors. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a worthy topic of study. At the same time, I, I will say that my own, my own experiences with elderly children, what we might call adolescents, kind of 16, 15, 17 year olds, is it's very striking that their level of, uh, their mental age is, you know, you're talking to a 15 year old, but mm -hmm. his mental age is, is 40 including unaccompanied minors. So one of, the, one of the issues that struck me was you talk to an unaccompanied minor and he says, I'm, I'm 20. He's not 20. Of course, none of them have documents. Their passports, they, couldn't, they either didn't have or how could you get a document in Syria, first of all? Asking, asking Syrian refugees to get a passport is the height of cruelty and cynicism because it's, you know, it's impossible. 
uh, and it's also a sign of treason in certain periods of the war to ask for a passport. But anyway, so none of them have documents, or the small or the trafficker took the documents as an insurance policy. All kinds of things happen, and one of the ways you get the unaccompanied minors is he gets rid of the document and then he says, "I'm 20," because he doesn't want to be stopped or doesn't want to be singled out. He realizes along the way, so he's misrepresenting himself that he's 20. He's actually 15. But when you hear the, the burden of responsibility that he has on his shoulder, uh, not just Syrians, like Pashtun, you meet a Pashtun kid who's 15 years old or 16 years old, and he was the chosen one from, the, from some village uh, persecuted by the Taliban, the chosen one of his whole village pooled resources so that he could be the one to get sponsorship to go to Europe. And he's been through the tear gas and the beating and the imprisonment and the smugglers and none of that matters nor is barbed wire going to prevent him because he feels the responsibility of his entire clan and his entire uh, uh, society to proceed to get to Europe and to make a living. And yeah, just when you talk to him, it's uh, when you talk to a Harvard undergraduate who's 22 years old, their mental age is maybe 15. And when you talk to refugee children, their mental age tends to be 30 years above what they, what they actually are. I should also say that uh, children are a commodity in the, in the refugee moral economy and that refugees themselves and the governments know this and that there's a very bitter war to, for example, can I give you just one anecdote? This was in Turkey, I think. So you're talking to a, UNA, to a camp manager and you say, no, oh, what's interesting? What's, what's, what's the gossip? What's going on? What's interesting? And he says, you know, there's a crazy story. He says, what's the story? I can't tell you. You know, he says, well, come on, tell us. You know, and then he said, you know, there was a rent a baby system. I say, what? So you can go talk to the cop. You go talk to the cop who discovered the rent a baby system. I say, what is the rent a baby system? And he says, you know, they were all making fun of me. The cop says, kind of straight, uniformed cop to look there. And people are moving, moving, moving. One of these transit camps, everyone's moving. And at some point he says to his colleagues, you know, this baby, I could have sworn I saw this exact same baby like the third time already today. And they tell him, oh, yeah, what are you talking about? You're, you're drunk again. Ha ha, you must be imagining things. And then it turns out it indeed was the same baby being circulated because when you're with a child, you get extra fast processing. You get the fast track at the camp where there's, for example, 2,000 people a day need to get registered and fingerprinted and processed and sent on their merry way. And if you are a single-aged military male, for example, you might get escorted into a special room to see if you are not perhaps a, right? But if you are with a child and especially a mother with a child, it's like at the airport where if you get that little fancy card for the global, you know those things when we, go to, when we used to go to airports <laughs> before, right? So we, I don't know if you guys heard, there's this corona virus apparently going around. I just found out about it. But before this, right, we used to go to airports. So you know that ticket when, you, when you're standing in line like an idiot and that guy has the global access entry points to go, grow across the queue and you think to yourself, my God, why didn't I pay the, the extra money for the extra faster? That's what a baby is. That's what a baby is in, in forced migration refugee movements, especially the more restrictionist they get, the more valuable it is to have a baby. So what these Syrian families were doing is they passed with the baby and then they rent the baby to the family from their neighborhood or from, the tr or from the city or their neighbors or maybe their cousins, right? A lot of cumulative causation, social capital, they're traveling together. And so they give the baby back to the people who haven't crossed the line yet. And so that's why this baby was being rented out for 30 euros uh, uh, to people without a baby so that they can get fast track. That was the rent a baby system. And then, and these cops discovered, and so... You know, if you would like to be puritanical about this, this is of course human trafficking par excellence, and you should arrest everybody and and pursue some uh, some uh, human rights uh, NGOs on unaccompanied minors, unaccompanied minor situation like up to here. In a, in, a, in another perspective, this is resilience, and this is how refugee resilience looks like in the real world, and they have to make situations like that all the time. There was, a, there was a famous case of a, uh, of a woman caught on camera spraying, uh, uh, sticking her child's head, 
her fa the face of her child, who was maybe five, six, in steam smoke, so that the smoke stimulates tears in the child's eyes, and then she and then she quickly picked him up and to run across a checkpoint. And this was circulated on right wing uh, 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 xenophobia, uh, you know, uh, circles in Europe, which are which are which are perhaps almost as provident as, they, as, they, as they're becoming in the United States that are very anti-refugee, anti-migration uh, uh, and uh, anti-Arab, Islamophobia and all the rest of it. This was circulated like, oh my God, look at the refugee mother. Look, would you ever stick your child's head into a, she's cheating. She's trying to use the tears of the child as a ticket at the checkpoint because if you show up with a crying baby, you're gonna get cer certain access and certain resources that that otherwise you wouldn't and look how she's cheating and what kind of mother is she does she perhaps hate her child and the answer is no the answer is i think if you go many of you might go to do field work you will find that in the real world these are the kinds of situations that you and much worse than this that you have to do to survive and that you have to move on and that you have to uh up to and including using the ch the children card and the, the, the idea of, you know, babies and children and innocence and, you know, the good refugee is, is of course, uh, not what it is on paper where it doesn't matter whether if you, you have the right to asylum, whether or not you are an adult in the field, uh, people are much more likely to give you the asylum rights that you deserve anyway, if you can somehow tie your faith to the, to the children thing. I mean, this is, people have written about this like... Fassan, I just want to recommend this guy Fassan in France. He wrote wonderfully about this moral economy of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of refugees. But thank you. Sorry for going on too long. Was F-A-S-A-N is the author that you're? Yes. Uh, F-A-S-S-I-N. Yeah. There's well, a certain stereotype. I, I apologize. Of... We're out of time for today. Um, but thank you so much for presenting a more complicated view of all of this and for the work that you've done. I think this was illuminating for everyone. Um, and thank you and stay safe in, in Cambridge. Um, thank thank you. you very much for, for your time today, Dr. Mandich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.